point of view is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the film? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple. And Lydia Contraceptive. With Lydia, you truly decide. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. On The Point of View, we get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. And you usually will go home with some useful insights. The name is Bernard Avlet's Interactive. If you're watching on television, get in touch with the WhatsApp number on the screen. If you're watching on any of the social media platforms, feel free to comment on the exciting stream down there. We have a big one. It's the day before the first post-COVID budget. It's a budget review. And I have the man who we affectionately call the proponent of techonomics <laughs> to help us do a preview of the budget review. He's in the studio to talk to us live for the next hour. Stay with us. So welcome back to The Point of View. Don't forget The Point of View is brought to you by Airtel Tigo. Life is simple. So before I build my case and get Mr. Tekpe's uh, arguments, let me say good evening to him. Honorable Tekpe, great to have you. Thank you very much and good evening. Great. What to does your a, viewers. Good evening. What does a former Minister of Finance do when you are no longer in office? Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I teach. Okay. So I, <clears throat> not full time, okay. I do adjuncts, you know, which, or part time. But adjunct, the difference between part time and adjunct is that I do not <clears throat> take a full, you know, semester, but okay. I support, you know, three lecturers. In which university? Then, uh, university of Ghana Business School. Okay. And what subject do you teach? Um, I teach public finance, I teach tax. And then, uh, oh, you teach tax. <laughs> yes. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so tax is your area? Uh, yeah, I started my career actually with the now GRE. Oh. Yes, then it was then called National Revenue Secretariat. And, uh, oh, okay. And uh, Honorable Atu Ahoy. You worked with Atu Ahoy? He was my boss. He was your and, boss? And Mr. Labisian. Oh, the the Labisian of GRE? Yeah. Yes. You worked with him Lavisian. and Atu Ahoy? Yes. Is this the 80s or the 90s? Mr. Lavician was the 80s national service. Both of them were 80s. After I did my national service in procurement, and uh, Mr. Lavician was then chief executive. Wow. Before he moved to NRS. I see. And then I joined, um, and it was there I got, I qualified. Did so that's where you, you got immersed in the tax philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're involved in the restructuring. I see. The removal of the... <clears throat> CEFs, IRS, from the civil service and making them autonomous with mm. Ghana-led. Uh, later, the creation of the... And so I was around when Professor Mills came to be the board chairman. And, oh, I see. Yeah, board of chairman. Of IRS. Yeah, for IRS and then commissioner before he became running mate. So when he was named running mate, you were working with him? Yes, I was working with him. So you knew that you were also going to government once he was moved into... When I was in policy... Like him, academic, he came into policy. I see. And so I've been in policy for quite I some see. time. Then I left. And then after my master's, came back. And I see. I was a coordinator for the value added tax when it was introduced, actually. You coordinated VAT? Yeah. That the, controversial <laughs> Kumi Preku VAT in 94, 95? Yes. And so that's when I knew quite a number of people. I see. So you teach public finance, you teach tax? Yes. At the master's level or? Both master's level and then the uh, level four. Finals, I, I see. Yes. <clears throat> For you. So that's what you do? So I do public financial management. I see. So you teach. Do you also do Galamse? I do some research. I see. Do you, you, do, you do Galamse? As in? No. Consult, consulting? Yeah, I do consulting. Because after I left the Ministry of Finance, I joined the IMF. Oh, okay. For about a decade. I see. 
and then came back to be deputy minister. I see. So you, you have so, IMF so track record. Is, Fair enough. Yeah. Yes. The fiscal well, affairs department and IMF. I see. So you are, you are still earning some good money? No, I actually retired. You retired? So, but I do consult. You consult? I do consult for okay. yes, World Bank IMF. Fantastic. Also, uh, I'm going to read a couple of stories f to set the scene for you. Uh, May 6, 2020. <laughs> COVID-19 has thrown government revenues out of the window. Nana Akufuado, the president. President Akufuado has said government projections for the year 2020 have been thrown out of gear following the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the president, the government plans and policies for the year 2020 will have to be amended. The president made this known at the Jubilee House on Wednesday. Here's a quote. I think it's important that everyone in the country knows that the government is one of the biggest, if not the hardest hit by this pandemic. We have huge parts of revenue that have gone out of the window as a result of the pandemic. Then he says, the 2020 budget, which was made in November, was predicated <coughs> on a $65 barrel oil. Today we, are, we know that oil is 18, 19, 20, 21 dollars a barrel. So even that statistic should tell you a big hole has been created as a result. And then the other continuation, the fight against the novel coronavirus is set to cost Ghana 9.5 billion cities. Finance Minister Ken Oforiata has said earlier, this will be 22.5% of Ghana's revised GDP. And he also says the pandemic will take a toll on Ghana's GDP growth. Mr. Foyata said a preliminary analysis of the impact of the virus on the real sector <coughs> shows that the 2020 projected real GDP growth could decline from 8% to 2.6% with an outbreak and a 1.5% with a partial lockdown. And then he says the overall Fiscal deficit will increase from the program 18.9 billion to 30.2 billion, which will be 7.8 percent of revised GDP. Then he says the primary balance will correspondingly worsen from a surplus of 2.8 billion, which is 0.8 percent positive, to a deficit of 1.4 percent or 5.6 billion. Mr. Furiata added. So this appears to be the premise for the mid-year budget. Let me read my second story. Mid-year budget to prioritize support for SMEs and industries affected by COVID-19. Finance Minister. Story, July 20. This is two days ago. Finance Minister Ken Ofriata will this week present the government's mid-year budget review to Parliament. It will focus on strategies to generate more revenue for the state after the coronavirus pandemic through the government's plans out of gear. Ms. Oferiata said the budget will also consider extending support to businesses and industries hit by the pandemic. And then it says the presentation aims at recovery for the economy, which has been affected by the virus. And then it's in accordance with Section 28, blah, blah, blah. Let me end with what a lot of people consider a masterpiece. Ken Oferiata writes an article for FT. This article came in the second week of April. What does an African finance minister do? A brilliant read. I'm reading the fourth and fifth paragraph because I can't get into the full headline. So he says, economic activity, I'm, I'm down in there, has been massively disrupted. Hotels are closing. This is like by the seventh paragraph. Industry is tottering. Airlines are grounded. And our toast of the region airport lies asleep. The Bank of Ghana cut rates by 150 basis points and reduced the reserve requirement by 2%, enabling banks to increase their lending to the private sector by some $500 million. A good effort, but an underwhelming response to what should be done. I need answers. He goes on. A U-shaped recovery is touted, but ours will likely be a steep drop, then a two- to three-year downward slide before a recovery, a trapezoid recovery. Then he talks about how he and Ernest Addison finished applying for IMF Rapid Credit Facility. Ghana and Africa desperately need fresh capital. And then he talks about the unfair call from Europe for a letter of credit for 200 million. So what is the world coming to? And he says other things about how Ghana is going to lose. Let me end with, what does an African finance minister do now? How can we restore 10 to 15% of GDP over a two to three year period? This is not a passing blizzard, as a friend of mine said. More like a long winter, even a mini ice age. Deep, deep words. So maybe let's start with this article and work our way backwards. Your, the man who takes over from you says, we are going to lose 10 to 15% of our GDP. 
he says it will take two to three years to restore the economy back to where it was pre-COVID. And he basically says everything has been hit. Do you sympathize with him? Thank you very much. I'll be charitable and not say that this is non-performance. And let me explain. <clears throat> the president mentioned that crude oil prices dropped from 63 mm -hmm. to around about 15. By the, by the way, it's true, but it has recovered. Crude oil prices are about 42. But the parallel I want to draw, you remember when we presented the 2015 budget in November, we used $99, not 68. Crude oil prices slumped, first below 30, and then went up and remained at $42, $45 for two and a half years. Sorry, for one and a half years. 2015, 2016. It is one of the reasons for ESLA. And this came on the heels of um, what we call Doomsock, which the vice president described as internal. It wasn't internal. It started with the rupture of the gas pipeline in Nigeria, if you remember, and the whole of West Africa was affected. We were not getting gas for two and a half years. Professor Mills inherited a global financial crisis. And then President Mahama inherited the uh, brick-led China in 2015, if you remember, which led to crude oil demand falling and crude oil prices falling. So we are saying we had one oil field when crude oil prices fell from $99 and remained at 42. Now we have three oil fields and prices are now at 42. So this is what President Mahama meant by if you haven't run government, sometimes you think it's easy. Right. So I'm saying there are parallels. I do admit that, and remember that the global financial crisis took a decade. It started in 2008. Professor Mills came in 2009. <clears throat> but everything was being blamed on non-performance. And it's deep. Now, what did we do? It was out of that that we, we had become middle income. You are not going to get many of the reliefs. That's the reality. That is what living beyond aid means. And that is what homegrown policy meant. So, you're saying, middle so just, okay, you're saying the first point the president makes about oil prices is well, neither here nor there because you have the same. Back, that was back okay. in, in, in March. Fair April. enough. But the finance minister mentions many industries. So as, as I read, he says economic um, yes. activity has been disrupted. Hotels are closing. To, no, Industry I'm is stuttering. Airlines are grounded. Airport is asleep. Bank of Ghana. Every, so it's not just oil. Everything is down. Yes, I'm about to concede to that. Because the difference between the global financial crisis is that the global financial crisis was severe. It took a decade but it didn't lead, lead to shutdown of economies. Mm -hmm. So that is the difference. But crisis will always come. Mm. For us in Ghana, it can be bushfire, which we experience under Rollins. We used to watch Akosomo, the level of the dam, if you remember. That's crisis. Mm. I mentioned the global financial crisis. I mentioned the brickleg crisis. This is severe because it affected the real sector of the economy, mm -hmm. unlike, say, Ebola, right, severer. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I do admit to the severity, and we'll come to it. But I'm saying that we must also remember that it was around that time we got oil. And what many countries do when they have excess, you know, when they have additional revenue coming into the budget, is that they begin to set up structures which will enable them weather such storm. Now, let me be brief. What did we do with Ghana Infrastructure Fund, Investment Fund? 
Not a penny has gone into Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund from oil after we left office. What did we do with the stabilization fund? It's even difficult. Pierre has said it. We can't even account for the stabilization fund. Yet still, when we hit the crisis in 2015, we withdrew 250 million Ghana cities from the stabilization fund to support the economy. I went to parliament twice, like Honorable Ken Furiata, to revise the budget. It was then, if you remember, in 2016, that President Mahama said, we were not going to do our 200 e-schools because of the fall in crude oil prices, which has affected the budget. So we reduced expenditure significantly. And we withdrew 250 million Ghana cities. We built up the stabilization fund. And the bulk of the 250 million US dollars, same figures, 250 million cities, 250 million dollars, I can say, was significantly what we put in with one oil field. So there was a lack of repression. The sinking fund, we use the sinking fund because you prepare for the things that affect the economy. So what are you saying? Are you saying this government didn't prepare for the crisis? I'm saying that they didn't continue. They didn't continue with what? They didn't continue with what with you started? Two. Yes. No, but they say you destroyed the economy. But I'm telling you, they inherited. I'm giving you the facts today. I'm saying that the 215 million US dollars, how many did they put into the stabilization what 15 fund? million dollars? The one we withdrew but for the whole, COVID. The, the man says we are losing 10 to 15 percent of our GDP. 250 million dollars is so small in comparison to that amount. But I'm saying that, you know, you build nations progressively. I gave you figures. I said 2015, we were able to take only 215 million Ghana cities mm. with one oil field. 2020, we took 215 million US dollars. And I'm saying much of that was from the one oil field. I'm also saying that we reduce our debt. I, I give you the graph. You see that the rate of growth of our debt was going down. And in fact, it's in the debt report. It's in the 2020 debt report. That graph is there. So, and then because we stopped using the sinking fund to pay down debt, which is required by this law, our rate of growth of debt started going up. What did we do again? So when you say we, you are talking about this government, not you. Yeah. When you well, say we stopped, you are talking about this government. This government, yes. yes. I'm talking about and collectively because they represent Ghana. Yes, I want to be clear. So yes, I'm talking they, about this they, government. They discontinued the plan you put in place, they, which they, is why they our dis debt accumulation has gone up. I'm saying they discontinued. Yes. They discontinued what countries, the middle-income countries, why they become middle-income strongly, the Asian tigers are what you call stabilizers and buffers when you have revenue. But they say the rate of debt accumulation in terms of percentage is slower than in your time. You can put up the graph. I'm saying that it's in the debt report for 2020, that graph. If Which you, of if the you, graphs? <clears throat> the graph on debt. On debt. And so that means, okay, I'll, I'll put it up, guys, put, put up his yes. graph. Meaning what? It's not true that the rate of debt accumulation, the percentage? No, you can say, let's put up the graph and then, but let me continue where the graph comes out. So I'm saying that one, the stabilizers that were put in place. Is okay, it, is this what you are talking about? Yes, if I may. Um, yes. You see the, the not the, the bars, mm. you see the line? Yes. It starts from 2014, it started, after the smart borrowing policy, it started going down. You see that it started going up again. From 2017. So what's that exactly. orange line? What's the orange line? The orange line is, is, the rate the, of is the rate at which you are adding to the debt. And your debt level will not go down or will not stabilize if you, okay. you don't, yes, if you don't reduce it. And I'm saying this is in the debt report. In fact, this is in the 2019 budget. So how, you know, somebody can say that they reduce, this is the rate of growth of the debt, and it's in the debt management report. Of the government? Of the government. So debt to GDP ratio in 2016 is about six, below 60%. It increases ever so slightly in 2017. And yes. it gets to 
60 something percent. So what you mean by slowing it down is that you can see that it is flatter and then it starts going up. Right? So what's the orange what's the orange the curve? orange line is the rate at which you are increasing this debt. So you're saying that from 2017, so from the MPP has increased our debt. From 2014, we started bringing it down when we established the sinking fund and others. Okay. So it, be, it was getting flat. And then when MDB came, because they were not putting money in the sinking fund. The they were not putting money in the sinking fund. Yes. That's why this curve is going up. The money was going to the sinking fund, but it was not being applied to debt. Okay. Pause there. Let me take you to Baumia because he said something uh, in the most recent lecture before the crisis about the economy and how they had changed the economy. So if you have Baumia, show me. He was talking about for the first time we had a, a, a positive, uh, what do you call it, F a primary balance. The IMF has reversed all of that. We'll come to it. Let me show you Baumia <laughs> and then I'll come to this. So this, this video is Baumia, a source from Joy News. This was an event he addressed in Kumasi in 2019. Let's hear him. Gentlemen, the challenge was huge. How can a, an, an economy that could not afford to pay teacher and nursing training allowances suddenly deliver lower taxes, restore teacher and nursing training allowances, create jobs, implement free senior high school education, create NAPCO, planting for food and jobs, one village, one dam, one constituency, one ambulance, reduce electricity prices, formalize the economy, industrialize the economy, reduce the cost of doing business, and so on. While at the same time, reducing the budget deficit and reducing the rate of borrow. It seemed an impossible task. And our opponents were emphatic that we could not fulfill our promise. But we were confident that with good economic management and by the grace of God, we could make what seemed impossible possible. It required a resetting of the fiscal and monetary policy framework in the context of the existing IMF program that we had inherited. IMF program had been completely run off track by our predecessors. We renegotiated the IMF program in a manner that provided fiscal consolidation at the same time creating the fiscal space to deliver on our promises to Ghanaians. It took some skill and experience on the part of the Ghana team to renegotiate the IMF program that ensures consolidation but at the same time strong growth and which I am happy to say Ghana successfully exited the IMF program in April last year. After three years in office the results of the fiscal consolidation are evident and the data shows that significant progress has been made to restore macroeconomic stability and economic growth. The growing confidence in the macroeconomy owes a lot to the prudent management of our public finances and monetary affairs over the last three years. To underpin fiscal discipline going forward, Ghana has for the first time in history passed into law a Fiscal Responsibility Act that limits the fiscal deficit in any year to a maximum of 5% of GDP and requires a positive primary balance to ensure debt sustainability. In addition to a Fiscal Responsibility Act, we established a Fiscal Council to provide oversight and advice on the implementation of fiscal policy. This has never been done in our history. So as a result of 
good fiscal discipline, the fiscal deficit on a cash basis has declined from 6.8% of rebased GDP in 2016 to 3.8% in 2018, 4.8% in 2019, below the fiscal rule of 5%. This, for the first time in a decade, so we are, we are managing the public finances better. For the first time in a decade, ladies and gentlemen, Ghana recorded primary balance surpluses. Primary balance surplus means that our tax revenue exceeded government spending, excluding debt service payments. For three years in a row, this is for the first time in a whole decade of 10 years, for three years in a row, we have achieved primary budget surpluses for the three years in a row. The primary balance surplus was 0.5% of GDP in 2017. So that was bionomics. What is the economics response? <laughs> First this was all, last year, yes. I already showed that the debt, the debt did not slow down. And that the MPP, it increased. We just proved that. And I'm saying anybody can check. It's in the 2019 budget. 2020 budget and is in the debt management report. That graph is there. That is the government's own, you know, uh, report. Secondly, we achieved fiscal balance in 2015. So it's not true. And if you look at the graph that they produced in 2017, you see that the graph line was going and then stopped at 2016. You can go back to the budget and you can take a look at it. So, so in 2015, did, what was your... We achieved a fiscal balance of about close to 1%. Now, is this the primary balance or, now, the, the, or the overall... The primary balance. I'm coming to the because, overall... So when he says that in the first time in a decade, yeah, it's not we, true. we have a positive primary balance, it's is not, not correct? It's not, yeah, it's not correct. Really? And Yes, it's in the 2015 budget. I'm looking for And it. Even, even the IMF acknowledged that we achieved, you know, the balance. A positive primary balance, positive primary balance in 2015. Yes, you can check. It's in the 2015 budget. Because the overall <clears throat> budget fiscal balance was negative. It was a deficit. Well, that is what they put there. And I'll show you. You will notice again. Let's take it one by one, please. Okay, go ahead. So that we go don't... Ahead. Yes, go ahead. He mentioned that the deficit in 2016 was 68 Notice mm -hmm. that he didn't say it was 9.3. That is because we proved to the IMF that they did an offset. And so it was only in this year that they stopped using 10.3 and 9.3, 9, 9 even on a rebase, you know, basis. They had always said that we left a hefty, yes. and that was, yes, you remember. It, yes. So it was revised. They never considered, but it was revised. The IMF revised that? No. The government, this one, the government itself revised it after we pointed it out. So your 2016 deficit you left them was not 9? It's not 9. What was it? He just said it. He said 6.8. It's actually 6.3. Now, let me also mention the more important one. But a deficit one, nonetheless. A deficit nonetheless. Of course, yes. Okay, go ahead. But it was exaggerated by the 3 nine. percentage points. Yeah, you are talking about th 9 and 6. Okay. Which is significant of GDP. Fair enough. Yes. And that's how they trumpeted. In fact, the reduction was done crudely in 2016, if you look at the 2017 budget. So what that means is that if there was a reduction, it was achieved under President Mahama, not under the MPP. It's because it was done to the, you have to go back and look at the, the 2017 budget. But let me, the more bigger one, you see, the deficit of 4.8, 2017, Mm -hmm. IMF is lower. Why? Because for the entire 2017, there was no provision for energy and there was no provision for bailout, even though we had done ESLA and we did the first restructuring in 2016. So they knew about these liabilities in January. They said it, the vice president and the minister said it in Washington that ESLA had enough to pay it off, to pay off the energy, yet there was no provision. That's how come the deficit 
was lower in 2017. So let me understand. You are saying <clears> that <throat> the budget deficit of 4.7 that they quoted excluded the energy sector and financial sector related costs in 2017 so that's why the figure was lower was lower yes so if you add that what if would you it be add, if you add that no the, it, it wasn't stated so we didn't even know the amount mm -hmm. but in 2018 mm -hmm. what if you add that in 2018 what will you get but first of all what did they do they excluded it and that's why you have 3.9 in 2018 yes and they showed it we know the figures because they showed it as in the appendix. Yes. And as a footnote. Yes. The first time any government has done that. But IMF has the same thing. So I have no. the IMF December thing. The they IMF... have the same thing. They also wrote overall balance. And then they wrote overall balance excluding financial and energy sector course, related costs as an saying, appendix three. Yes. But what we do is that we show it as exceptional costs above the line. They showed it as an appendix. So what's your point? My point is that the deficit is there the table I gave you, the IMF has revised the four point, the 3.9 deficit by this conventional approach to 6.7. And in the COVID report, they revised it to 7%. Really? Yes. For 20? 2018. So the deficit in 2018 was not 3.9. So it's higher than your 2016 one? Much, much higher. Really? Yes. I see. In the I COVID, see in, am, in, so you're saying that the creative you accounting. You can look at the there, COVID table. I, I can see. So yes. you're saying that if we add the energy and the financial sector related cost, their 2018 deficit is even higher than what you left for them. And why would you have to add it? Because we added single spine. Hey, single spine again. No, I'm, I'm telling you that's an exceptional. I'm telling you. No, I'm telling you the principle. The principle is that if you have an so exceptional. So if you took out single spine from yours, what would your deficit it be? It would be much lower. That's so, point. so, but you chose it to add it, same, but they say they won't add it. No, no, no. It's a principle. Let's, let's be clear. Okay. If you take out hippic revenues, uh -huh. if you take out hippic revenues because they were exceptional, if you take out divestiture costs in the uh, Rawlings era. Okay, so viewers, we are just showing you what he's talking about. Yes. So you are saying that yeah. physical balance, including exceptional cost is a different one when you exclude exceptional cost. So at the bottom, you exclude exceptional cost, you have lower figures. But at the top, if you add the exceptional cost, which is the financial sector reform and energy, the figures are much, much they higher. They are much, much higher. So you see IMF article 4, 6.7, 2097. So fair enough, you're saying, let's add energy cost. So what? No, no, it's more than that. We are saying that, tell the public that the 4.7, 4.7, 3.9, that's you are showing, which you are saying you, you perform better than other governments, you excluded those costs. And if you include them as in divestiture, as in, you know, bushfires, as in, we have always had exceptional costs, then your real deficit is 7.67, and it's, it's supposed to be 9. Wow. Well, so, that, so, that, so the first, so that is, that's a, so it's very important for us. And this, this was done in March. Right, COVID was much. This revision was done as part of going for the COVID. So you've load. spoken about debt, you've spoken about deficit. Two things. I'll take a break. When I come back, there are other issues because they will say they lowered inflation and the growth was much better before COVID. Because the main argument here is that the man's budget tomorrow, or which is, which is Thursday, is premised on the fact that there was a recovery before COVID disrupted it. You're saying there's no recovery. We'll, we'll let you prove that. You've said that. I know, the numbers are showing. Yes, but you've shown, there are only, you have many parameters. You are, you are talking about debt. You're talking about deficit. But the other things you use to measure an economy. So yes. there's growth rate, there's inflation. So no, I'll come to reason, that. No, but the reason I'm... But I need to get... Uh, my advert, otherwise, don't give me advert next year. So you have to let me yes, go. Yes, fine, I understand. <laughs> so that. please allow me. <laughs> the man, he doesn't want me to take a break, but I have to. <laughs> so please, I'll be back. No, no, this no is sorry. A, this is the point of you. Minutes. Stay with us. <laughs> Bundles. Live extra only on Airtel Tigo.
Dial star 111 hash now. Airtel to go. Life is simple. Hello, my brothers and sisters. I'm John Mahama. The Electoral Commission of Ghana is compiling a new voter register in all parts of the country. And all Ghanaians, 18 years and above, are eligible to register. Whether you have previously registered or voted in an election before, you must register now to be able to vote in the December 2020 elections. The time to make a change is now. Register today to vote in December and make a difference in your life and that of your family. Your vote is your voice. To be able to vote, you must register. Register now and let's do it for Ghana. Welcome back to the point of view. My guest is former finance minister Sir Tech, but these days he consults and teaches public finance and tax. He's saying that the claim that COVID has disrupted the economy is not necessarily true because the economy was already going down before COVID came. That's his main argument. And he's saying that if you look at debt accumulation and if you look at the way the deficit was behaving, we're in a bad situation before COVID. Okay, you've shown me some charts to show that debt was not doing well i had wanted to read something to you from the imf and not to hold brief for the government but in december 2019 when the executive board concluded the article for consultation I'll just read two paragraphs december 6 2019 covid came in march okay the outlook for ghana remains favorable growth is expected to increase from 6.3 percent <clears throat> in 2018 to 7 percent in 2019 and to average around five percent over the next five years next few years supported by new potential oil discoveries and mining inflation. Consumer price inflation has stayed close to the center of the target band in recent months, despite the pass-through from city depreciation and higher utility tariffs, and is expected to decline to around 6% over the medium term, this inflation. International reserves remain stable, thanks in part to external borrowing. And then they give the breakdown and they said the 2020 budget is projected to deliver a headline deficit of 4.9% of GDP, equivalent to an overall deficit of 4.6%. At current policy, the overall deficit is projected to stabilize over the medium term to about 5% of GDP. And then the officer said downside risks remain and stuff. But I'm, I'm saying that this, no, the, the this main, appears the main, to be no, a favorable main, review. Yeah, but let me make a quick comment on this. Yes. The main reason given here is because we are going to be getting, you know, more oil, right? We said almost the same, and the IMF, you can go back to the ECF report, said the same thing with respect to Sankofa and Tenfield, and it was dismissed. In fact, that is the point on which we keep making, the, we keep saying that the 2017 performance, which they are taking credit, was actually investments made in 2016. Which but, is, but which is say, a, let, just with this executive board assessment, so I read the staff no, no, I'm review. Saying I, I just like, you know, they are saying that executive directors agree with the trust of the staff appraisal. I'm coming. They commended the Ghanaian authorities for the strong macroeconomic performance. I'm reading December 2019. And they commended the Ghanaian authorities for the strong macroeconomic performance and laying the foundation for sustained and more inclusive growth. So I, are you, are you telling no, that no, this no, just the, the on one, oil? No, excuse me. The one you read earlier on. This was the staff assessment. Then I the read the executive board yeah, agreement the, with the staff, staff assessment. Exactly, yes. But I'm saying that the MPP dismissed something similar on account of the when we were saying that the prospects for the economy was going to be bright on account of Sankofa and Tenfield, they dismissed it outright. Yesterday, in 2017-2018, crude oil prices increased from $70,000 barrels per day to nearly 200000 by 2019. MPP right. dismissed, was it what the team was saying? Was it IMF who they said, said it or it you said it? was no performance. Well, no, were they disputing what IMF we said? We said it in our it's, Yes, it's, it was in the... You see, in fact, the, the, the World Bank and the IMF all showed that Ghana's prospects after 20, 2016 because the crisis was going to be over. So it's just like if COVID crisis is over, you know, the prospects will be good. But I'm talking... The key so, you, you are also, so are you also dismissing this because MPP dismissed it? I'm not it. dismissing it. 
I'm saying that not in government, and it, it, we must all recognize that Ghanaians, right? No, but I don't understand. If the IMF says in December so that the then guys then are doing well, and yes. you are saying that because they disagree with your assessment, you also disagree with this one. No, I'm saying that we are building a nation, and I'm saying that if you see, mm -hmm. right, that our trajectory going forward, right, on account of ten field and some uh -huh. you dismiss the unknown performance. Mm -hmm. Why do you come and then tell us that the economy will be good again in the IMF on account of new oil fields, which was something you dismissed? But let me, let me move on quickly. The, so I have, I have shown that the deficit debt is the same. Debt has been revised. But you see, I think we must pay attention as Ghanaians. I'm quoting the IMF. Fitch said our deficit was going to be more than 10%, and our debt is going to hit 70. If you remember, Moody's reversed you know, the upgrade before COVID. Even this morning, even this morning, the uh, Economic Intelligence Unit, EIU, posted a warning on Ghana. So I'm saying that, and I'm saying all this is because what the world was being told, right, as impressive was based on corrections that these institutions are now making. And what we expect of the Minister for Finance tomorrow is to say, do we agree with these institutions? These are global institutions. Do we agree with these institutions? And therefore, is the government going to revise and tell us that our deficit? Because you can't exclude it, but you finance it, and the debt will expose you. And that is exactly what is happening. Because the deficit is what, let's get it logically, the deficit is revenue minus expenditure. Mm -hmm. And then you have the deficit. And the deficit is what you finance to increase your debt. So if you have a lower deficit, you shouldn't be having higher debt. Mm. But whatever you show below the line, you are going to be financing. So even if the deficit so the figure alert, is lower, exactly. the debt will show a different thing. Will show because whatever you are showing below the line and which the IMF calls off budget, you are going to be financing. And it will show in Bank of Ghana's book. It will show. Do you, do you think the IMF should have been firmer in the way they analyze the what you call creative accounting? Because I heard the country rep try to say that there was a disagreement about how the data was presented. They didn't outright say the government was wrong. Well, because you are saying that that's not how you do it. That's what the point you are making. But I didn't exactly no, say we that. We pointed out to the end. Yeah, but they, they, and they are like the referee in this case. They are basically saying, but, well, it's a difference of opinion, but it's fair enough. No, but we are Ghanaians, right? We said, where is it in the IMF? By the way, why did we rush to the front? Mm -hmm. Right? COVID. Yes. I'm not, I'm not done playing COVID. I think I need to be very clear on this. But I'm saying that a lot was happening already. Why did we make a U-turn after we exited the IMF? Exit means that you won't go to the IMF for a program. We went to the IMF in March, very early in COVID, right? One billion time, dollar interest-free loan for Ghana. Well, still, it is 100% of our quota. We cannot go to the fund to borrow, you know, immediately. So you think the March IMF we went to was too early? No, what, the question we should ask is why didn't other African countries rush? to go to the IMF in, in March and April. We had a stronger economy, according to the government, than other African countries. And we're comparing ourselves. So why the rush? So what are you saying? That movement to IMF in March exposes I that things were not... I am saying that we can come to the COVID financing. Mm -hmm. Back when the Article 4 report was issued, there was a gap. Mm -hmm. which was to be filled domestically. Mm -hmm. And this explains the Bank of Ghana borrowing. Right? There was a gap. Now, this has been revised. And the COVID financing is 2% mm. of GDP. So, and if we now agree that we are going to end, let's say, at 10%, mm -hmm. and the COVID financing is 2 and we are ending at 10, then the, what was the balance to be expected before that? It's eight. And that's why I'm saying that it's the result of the revision of all this. And we are now coming to agree. Let's not delude ourselves. Tomorrow, we are going to agree 
with these institutions that the deficit they projected you know, is going to be 10%, but it's going to be put on COVID. And we are saying before COVID, there was, the deficit was already projected to be 7%. So they will try, you are saying it, the finance minister will blame COVID for the 10% deficit we have to see at the end of the year. And you are saying that that 10% predicted the COVID problem. I'm saying that pre-COVID and COVID. I'm not saying, I'm so showing you that. I see. But the other point is that if you take the 1 billion, that 2% was calculated as 9.5 billion Ghana cities when we went to parliament, if you remember, mm -hmm. as a cost of COVID. Mm -hmm. If you take the borrowing 1 billion, it's 5.5 Ghana cities. If you take the 250 million US dollars, which we drew down, that gives you another, you know, uh, millions. If you take the World Bank mm -hmm. and you take other funds that are coming in, then we calculated it to be about 10%. So COVID is covered. At least the cost that way. If we are going to have new costs tomorrow, that's a different matter. But the costs that were given to us at 9.5, these revenues covered it. So why are we borrowing from Bank of Ghana? Why are we borrowing more money? It is to cover the deficit, the gap, which I'm talking about from Article 4. As a result of the adjustments which you are talking about. So you, we've, spoken, <laughs> we've spoken for 47 minutes. You, you spent a lot of time talking about the deficit and the debt. Are they because the, the issue is about financing. Tomorrow is going to be, we are going to hear that because of COVID, we are going to, we need to borrow. The minister said it already. We, are, we need to borrow, we need to, but we need to understand. We are saying, yes, COVID is tough. And yes, we are going to, we need to borrow, you know, to save lives for PPEs and for frontline workers and what well, that's not what we are we are saying we shouldn't borrow for but we are saying if we are going to borrow and say that the deficit is 10 percent let's say that let's consider that the uh, COVID financing is only two percent and the rest of the borrowing that has been including the three billion you know uh, uh, US dollar bond right is for purposes other than COVID because we did not reduce expenditure and so what are those, you know, expenditures? What is Bank of Ghana financing? If we have covered, if we have mm. covered COVID already, what is Bank of Ghana financing? So if the, if the fine, so <coughs> uh, if debt, fine. But what about inflation? Inflation came down quite drastically. It's been, it was around 15% in your time. It came to around 8 in the past couple of years. Now, yeah. on the monetary yeah. side, if you are analyzing an economy, they've done pretty well on the inflation, haven't they? Or that doesn't count for anything in no, this of course. conversation? No, no, we, but we've never said that they never achieved anything. Unlike the non performing no, that's not the point. We have to be pragmatic. So we are saying, yes, inflation may have, may have dropped, but as Honorable Fifi pointed out yesterday, we have also had a record of declining inflation. So it's not an inflation, the dynamics determines. What about the four so, months of import cover? For the first time, we had a positive trade balance. When you look at our trade balance, uh, we, we there, there, was a, there was a trade balance in 2019. That's not been, we haven't had that. We had a trade deficit for years. That, I mean, we should be doing better with three oil fields and more exports with, with, with nearly 200,000 barrels per day compared to 70,000 barrels, one field with three fields. Sorry, we should be doing better, right? Because if we did three, with one oil field. But what percentage of our GDP is the oil revenue? The oil revenue is not even up to 10%. So why are you emphasizing so much on the oil? Three fields. Yeah. How, much, how much are we getting from the oil? Of course, because the entire capital budget, for example, is ABFA. And the oil revenue is what we use to reduce debt. So it's important. It's important. And oil revenue is what is accounting for the growth. What if they talk about free SHS? The amount of money they spent in such a social, they call it a flagship social program. Increasing rapidly the number of people who have gone to school. Surely, if they haven't used the money to pay debt and they've used it to fund free SHS, you can concede that no, that's... We, no, we had our version of progressively free, free uh, education, uh, uh, SHS, right? So we had our version. We said, take the schools to the community. That is what is done in Britain. That is what is done in the U.S. Secondary schools are in the community. And the kids work it's a short distance, or you take trotro and you go. They have included boarding and everything. That would have reduced costs. Imagine if we had even 120 East schools completed. Most of the day students who are being posted from their community today and sleeping on verandas, they wouldn't be sleeping on verandas, right? 
So we had it. We, we also had it. But what I expect tomorrow, right, is the fact that we are using 2.2 billion Ghana uh, 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 billion of the sovereign bond to finance free SHS. So are we going to continue borrowing to finance free SHS after using oil revenue for free SHS? We need to know. We'll take a short there break. There is a silence. We'll take a short break yes. and come back to that. We're discussing the economy with Seth Tekpe. He says, yes, COVID has affected us, but things started getting bad before COVID. And he says, tomorrow's budget review will expose the fact that even though we say our deficit is great, we are going to borrow more and the two work together. We'll take your comments as well. Stay with us. just not ready yet. I want to wait a little before getting pregnant again. Stop worrying and live free. No matter who you are, Lydia has a contraceptive just for you. Choose the Lydia Daily Contraceptive Pill with Ion as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD, a non-hormonal contraceptive for long-term pregnancy prevention. Contact the Lydia Contact Center and let us help you decide how to live free. With Lydia, you truly decide. don't always agree and that's fine as long as we respect each other and play by the rules it doesn't matter who you vote for what matters is that you make your voice heard and that every vote counts a new clean voters registry ensures that no matter who you vote for democracy always wins go out to register today Welcome back to The Point of View. Let me read some comments. Uh, I have a comment from Dr. Gideon Boakon, who is Dr. Baumier's spokesperson. He says, from independence to the end of Kufo's time in 2008, our total debt was $9.7 billion. NDC and their mills increased it to 356 in 2012, which was a 267% increase. From the Mahama, from the Mahama increased it to 122.2, which is a 243% increase. From that, it is now 214, including even the banking sector bailout, which is 76% increase. How can those who increase our debt stock by over 250% every four years tend to accuse the one who increased it by just 76%? If you like, add even the borrowing coming after COVID and say the percentage increase is even 100%. That's a reduction in the rate of debt accumulation from the average of 250% increase under the NDC era. Then we go to Dr. Kofi Amwa. Good evening, Bernard and Honorable Former Minister. The reality of COVID-19 blows open the wrong policies of most Ghanaian governments so far. Until almost all our development policies focus on deepening our domestic economy, maximum employment of our youth and fertile land resources will always be at the mercy. Going forward, we must focus on jobs, jobs, jobs to help curtail imports, increase exports and build wealth. Um, let me read a few more comments. Uh, Bernard, the statistical gymnastics of this government is laughable. All debt is a liability on government irrespective of classification. Classifying debt as energy of financial sector debt and treating it differently doesn't absorb, gov absorb government of responsibility. It doesn't affect the financial position of Ghana. So wh who, why, why this plain smart? Koshi from Denu. Good evening, Bernard and Tekwe. Please ask the former minister if he appreciates the financial interventions of the government to businesses in this COVID-19 era. If he does, why won't he appreciate that the economy has been hit hard by the novel disease? but rather claiming that the economy was worsening before COVID. Kali note that he is on record to have okay some borrowing by government to cushion the economy. Osman Odro Amini. 
the mere fact that this government gives a financial report to IMF different from what is presented to Parliament and Ghanaians depicts their dishonesty and disingenuity when it comes to the management of the economy. The massaging of economic figures by this association depicts the worst nature of the economy. <coughs> Evans Goldman from Achimota. I'm watching you live, Bernard. I think you are simply taking Baumia's figures and not bothering to cross-check from the budget and other credible sources from Ernest. Okay. Well, I have Mr. Tekbe here, so I'm sure he will not allow Baumia to go scot-free. You have just four minutes, so I need you to make your most important point. You're saying, one, the deficit and the way they accounted for it has been exposed by the borrowing. And number two... By the borrowing and by the institutions that are revising our figures now, enough. and we must take note of it. Good. But there's something else. When the finance minister wrote this article, he says, you, Europe has met. They are sharing 750 billion pounds. Some of them are even giving it as grants to each other. He says that kit is not open to us. But he says the German finance it's minister says... It's not open because we are a middle-income country. I'm coming. He yes. said the German finance minister says he doesn't want to hear about budget deficits anymore because everybody wants to save the economy. Shouldn't we stop talking about all these numbers and simply say, where can we get money to give to Ghanaians who have been hit by COVID? Shouldn't that be the argument? Of because course. that appears what the Europeans are doing. They are not thinking about any numbers. They are no, just saying, give mid, money to the people. No, as a middle-income country, that's the trajectory. And, that is, and what you do is that you set structures in place. And that's why I was careful at the beginning to say that because we become a middle-income country, we needed to put certain structures which middle-income countries and advanced countries have put in place. So let me ask you, if you were in the finance minister today with a COVID that has hit an economy and you were presenting a budget tomorrow, what would your solution be? Or with all the industry suffering, government revenue is no, also suffering. we went suffering. through crisis. We went through crisis. And what we did, we reduced the uh, 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 expenditure first. Even political promises, we reduced them. Now we are adding even more. 88 hospitals and the rest. Instead of reducing and direct the, you know, the expenditure. Finishing what is there to cater for the, what is, you want to start a new one. Right? And then we also said that we started creating buffers. So that in the event of a, so if we were there, and we, were, we, we would have continued putting money in the stabilization fund out of the oil revenue, three oil fields, and maybe we would so have, made, we would have been able he, to support. He should tell the political people that they should stop the promises and the new hospitals and those things, because it's not a time for that. They should cut down no, on no, those No, 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 no. I'm saying that, no. I'm saying that hospitals are important. But if we had continued no, you, with the hospitals... I'm saying that, that we're now, the money is presenting a budget tomorrow. What should he do? Should he... Tell the political people to cut those things or he should still deliver those things. What My point do? is, no, of course, I'm saying whatever he says, and he has given an indication that we'll be borrowing. Yeah, we support private sector and all that. We are saying, one, if you are going to borrow for COVID and you are going to, please don't put it in footnotes. Let us know the focus and the impact on the economy. We are saying that if you are going to... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. If you are going to uh, provide, if you are going to say that the deficit is 10% or 9%, don't say it is all on account of COVID. Tell us what the fund has revised, whether the deficit is 7 and therefore if you add, you know, then the finance is just 3. And account for the difference between your 4.7 and the 7 separately. So we are saying it's about transparency. And to, uh, to my good friend, Dr. Barkun, we are very good friends. Um, if he has issues, they should correct the graph. Okay. The graph is saying something different from what, and I'm saying that graph is in the debt management report. It doesn't show that they have slowed down borrowing. That's the most important thing. All right, thank you. So you can correct the graph. Thank you, Honorable <laughs> Seth Imano Tekpe, former Minister of Finance, now a lecturer and a consultant. There will be a budget presentation tomorrow. CTT will be live from 10 a.m. till the discussion is over. My name is Ben Adavle. Thank you for watching. The Point of View will be with you next time. Bye-bye. Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Even our bonus data doesn't expire. You the feel am? Dial star 111 hash to activate now. Etel Tigo, life is simple. And Lydia Contraceptive, with Lydia, you truly decide.